Hey there, everybody. It's uh, Adam Zollinger here from LearnArcViz.com. And in this video, I want to show you some of the tips and tricks of doing a large scale animation with 3ds Max and V Ray and Forest Pack Pro. I'm doing lots of landscaping in this one, all done with Forest Pack Pro, it makes it so much easier. I'm going to show you around in my file and just give you a, a good feel for the workflow and what it's like to create an animation like this with a professional ArcViz workflow. So uh, let's jump right in. Okay, here's the file, and you can see there's a lot going on. I've got a basic PDF colored site plan lay, laid out down here below, and that's what I've drawn everything to. I don't have all the CAD that I need for this, but that's okay. I can use the PDF and just put it in here as an image. And then you can see I just built on top of it. And one thing that's interesting about this file is all this landscape going on. You can see this is all forest pack items, which I haven't gone over in my classes before. But for this animation, it's totally necessary. You can see the trees are all proxied and used multiple times. That's why they're proxied. It's important to do that to save memory when rendering and to save just your computer from having to display all the objects. It cuts down the polygons on it here to 10,000 or whatever you set when you export the, the proxy. If you go into my XRefs, you can see that the trees are all X reft in, which is also good because these are really heavy polygon wise. Each tree is over a million polygons. So it's nice to be able to just turn it on and off or even display it as a box like that. Because even when it's proxied, it's still 10,000 polygons per tree and there's a lot of trees. Okay, so you need to be able to see what those are going to look like, but it's handy to be able to turn them on and off. Layer management becomes very important in files like this so that you can turn things on and off. I haven't done great layer management here, but um, it is an important part. Like all these plants, I wanna be able to turn those off so my viewport doesn't get too heavy. And keep in mind, my video card in this computer is not great. It's just the stock one that came with my computer. And it's kind of a, it's a gaming level of NVIDIA card, but it's not by any means the best gaming card you can get. And it actually, works just fine for VR and as you can see it navigates the viewport pretty well too. So that's all good. Um, these are things that I purchased. These these are ivy slash vine things that I needed to put on these walls. So I made a big chunk of it, proxied the whole thing together and then just kind of copied it around. The original model mo looks more like that. That, that part's not proxied because it needed to be unique. Some other things that we're doing here. Uh, this fence. This was one of the more tedious parts of the modeling. Um, I've showed this before, but one thing that you can do to make a fence like this is draw just your base line right here. See that spine under there? And I'm using that to sweep this wall down here. You can see it's a sweep. There's the cap on the wall and the sidewalk and the curb. That's all going off that exact same sweep. And then for this, I just moved that spline up, made it renderable, moved it up some more, copied it, moved it up some more, made it renderable there. And then I made one of these pickets here and one of these here and used the spacing tool and told it to make as many copies as it needs to go every four inches all the way along that line. And then this one's every eight feet all the way along that line. So in that way, with a few simple tools, you can make that fence uh, pretty easily. The hard part is getting the line right in the first place. Okay, then I use some other te techniques that I've shown before where I just made one big mesh for all this stuff. I did a UVW unwrap on it and painted it in Photoshop. Let's see what that looks like real quick. You can grab the material and look at the diffuse map here. It looks like that. Okay, so the polygon is unwrapped and obviously that creek area is all happening right in here. And it's just a humongous map with kind of uh, some kind of grassland looking stuff painted on it. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. If you look at, if you put another unwrap on this, unwrap UVW, you could go into the open UV editor and you would see with this object that there it is unwrapped. It's really just a flat map of that thing. And so it exports this whole square and I just painted right here, made, it, made sure it was really high resolution so that even though I'm painting on this little part when I go into my cameras, uh, it still doesn't get blurry or anything like that. So that is that. The f forest pack stuff, like I mentioned, 
Once I have my big mesh of uh, landscape here of the terrain, I can then just start using forest pack to say, okay, throughout this whole terrain, spread this little this little grass mesh. And it obviously, it, it, it automatically kind of makes these little proxies for it. They're not exactly proxies, but they work similarly. And then you can also set it up so it's only modeling or only spreading landscape in the areas where the camera can see it. So the active camera is determining which part of that is actually uh, rendering. So if I get down into my cameras here, got this creek area. So everything with, that's within this camera is getting covered now by the forest pack item. And you can see that there's just plants everywhere. All these little dots are plants that will render. Okay, and you can see that up here I have a bunch of trees scattering all over using the V-Ray, or sorry, the Force Pack Pro as well. And that kind of encloses the whole property so that I don't have to worry about what is beyond it. Okay, for the sky I just have an HDRI that has a horizon line with trees and then a nice sky. And so that kind of creates the background. So these trees are kind of the middle ground. Beyond that all you see is the background and that kind of... Um, closes in the whole project for me so that I don't have to worry about modeling a bunch of stuff around the site or anything like that. So this force pack thing is really awesome. You can also draw shapes that you want to cut out of the force pack items. So you can see there's like some lines in here, like this line right here. There's a force pack item I didn't want. Actually, that's just what is included in the force pack item. So everything inside of this line is going to be rendering a different force pack item, which has some more wildflowers and things like that. And you can also exclude things using lines. Actually, that is an exclude. You can see the forest pack item right here. These gray flowers will not happen within this spline here. Okay, in forest pack, you could do, I could do several lectures and maybe even a whole course on how to use forest pack. But if you haven't ever checked it out, definitely do, especially if you have to do a big old animation like this with a bunch of landscaping. The landscaping happens to be a very important part of this project. So the only other thing really to talk about is just the animation itself. Let's look at one of these cameras here, like physical camera two, okay? You'll see that all it is is a very simple pan of the camera as a car drives by. So this is kind of a good way. I follow the car kind of throughout the course to kind of tell the story of, of what it would be like to live here. Okay, so you enter in here. And at the same time, I'm using camera motions that will kind of show off the buildings, the architecture as well. Okay, so animating that car was easy. It was just a matter of drawing a line that I want the car to follow, right? So that car just animates along that line. What you do to do that is select this. You go to your motion tab, which would be that one. And you say, assign controller and you see the position is controlled by a path constraint okay normally by default it would be the Euler XYZ controller which is just transforms basically but you can add a you can select position there hit this and I've showed this in other classes but what you do is for the position you put a path constraint there and you can see it's already selected Okay, and then once that path constraint is, is selected to determine the position of that car, you can then add the path that you want to make the car follow, which would be that line there. So you can see line 006 is the line that that's going to follow. You can see my, the gizmo of my car is on the ground on the back axle. Okay, so as the car goes around the line, it rotates around that point, and you can see new forest pack items appear as my camera changes because they now come into view right okay so that car will follow that line perfectly and you need to make sure that it follows follow needs to be checked here and the animation is just this percentage here okay so the line the the car like this keyframe is saying make it zero percent of the line right here so at this keyframe that car is at zero percent of the line and somewhere down the road, it's at 100% of that line, which means it's at the very other end of that line. Okay, so it winds way all the way down here. You have to make sure that it hugs the ground perfectly. And then the other thing you have to do for that spline is to normalize it because 
The car will change speeds based on how much interpolation is going on in the line as it's following it. So what you do is a normalized spline. You'll see that I have that here. And what that does is actually place a vertice every two feet. Boom, 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 all the way along, okay? So make your line first, then put a normalized spline on it. And that will make it so that all vertices are exactly two feet apart, which means this thing will go the same speed all the way along. So you can adjust speed by placing more or less vertices. But in this case, I wanted to normalize the spline so that it's just going at a constant rate, which as it's going around turns and stuff, it should be slowing down, but I don't have to worry about that for this particular animation, but keep that in mind. So let's see what some of these cameras look like. Let's say this one. Uh, we already looked at camera two. Let's look at camera four. You can see all my force pack items are there. I've got that car that's animating through my scene. I've got this camera with a basic keyframe down here near the ground, and then it just kind of pans up as the car approaches the bridge. Oh, one final thing with that car is if you want to do it right, right here I would have, I would open up the group, and I would actually add some keyframes to turn this wheel as it's going around the turn. So along the x-axis I would do that, right? and then add keyframes for it. And the other thing that you need to do is along the local axis of that wheel. Oh, I don't wanna move the camera like that. So it would be along the X axis here. You need to rotate that like, you know, thousands of degrees. 360 degrees would be one rotation of that wheel. So you'd set a, you'd set a keyframe way back at zero. You can see there is one already. And then somewhere at the end of your animation, you'd set that same keyframe rotation, that X rotation to say 20,000. Okay, so as the car's driving, that wheel is rotating. Okay, and you could do math to actually figure out how far it's gonna travel, what the circumference of that wheel is, and then you could make the rotation match it exactly. But visually, you don't actually need to do that. You just need to see that that car has definitely got a wheel that's turning on it. And you could even put motion blur on it in order to make it so it just looks like a spinning blur of a rim, which is perfect. That's what you would really see in real life, so that'd be fine. Any other cameras? Let's see. So you can see all my camera shots are not like really long, continuous camera shots that will make you sick. They're just little camera pans and camera trolleys and trucks and whatever you call all that stuff. Okay, so it's just kind of going across this ravine here, slowly focusing on the pool house. Okay, so there it is. And when this is all rendered, this all looks really nice because of all the, the lush landscape going on. I'll show you a quick preview of some of my, just my really rough, rough frames that are not finished or high quality, but it'll give you an idea of what it's kind of gonna look like. Okay, there's one really rough frame of that ravine area with the creek in it. So there it is. There's all, all that forest pack stuff coming together and uh, looks pretty good to me. There might be some more tweaks that we want to do, but that's some of the basics of doing a big old scene like this with animated cameras and all that stuff. Um, yeah, and Forest Pack Pro, Pro was my best friend on this project, so check that out if you haven't got it already. And my final tip for this project is just my render settings. It's pretty simple. I just went, I just set it up like normal renderings basically. In the past, I've done a radiance map and light cache here, but you have to pre calculate the radiance map to do that. Recently, I found that just doing brute force GI is good because there's no pre calculation necessary. I use brute force and light cache. And I'm sure there's people out there that understand all the, the, the optimal settings for animation better but this has been giving me good results, so I go with it, and it's pretty fast. Brute Force with just default settings there and then Light Cache at 600. You could go bigger on that if you wanted. And then I go to, instead of saving it in the common tab, I save this the in the V-Ray frame buffer right here. Sa make sure separate render channels is checked, and save RGB and save alpha. And I save it out as just JPEG sequences, so each frame is one JPEG. Okay, and I have a multi-mat, a 
V-Ray Z-Depth, a V-Ray Background, and another Multimat. Those are basically object selections, material selections that render out as solid R, G, and B channels so that I can mask them in After Effects. So my files, uh, there's a ton of them. There's a, J a JPEG of each one of these and the RGB and the alpha for every single frame in my animation. And in After Effects, I can easily bring those in and composite as JPEG sequences. I use the Z-Depth to add some, uh, some atmospheric depth to my scenes. I use these multi-mats to select certain materials in my scene and possibly tweak the colors in post in After Effects. And then um, I use the alpha and the V-Ray background in case I want to change the exposure light intensity of the background or even replace the background using an alpha channel, anything like that. So that's how I prefer to do it. I save out all those channels together and then bring them in as different, different clips in After Effects and composite them all together to get it looking exactly how I want. It's very nice to have that control afterwards, especially on like the tweaking colors and materials and that kind of stuff. And I love that V-Ray Z-Depth channel too. You can also use it for depth of field if you have special plugins for After Effects because it is a depth channel and just like in Photoshop, you can change the focus based on that depth channel. And uh, that's a pretty handy effect to use. I'm not going to use it for this animation, but it is a very essential render element that I always make sure to render because there's various different ways to use it to make it cool. You can use it for fog. You can just add some atmosphere to your scene using the Z-Depth channel. All that stuff is really cool. So make sure and render with channels to have the maximum control. And that's it on the render settings. As you can see, I mean, this was low quality renders. So I just have it and with bucket type rendering. And then I went minimum subdivisions 1 and 4 and the noise threshold at 0.01. So this is not very high quality renderings. But it is rendering each frame in about 1 minute 15 seconds, which is perfect because I'm just doing previews right now when I'm ready to render a full-blown animation I would maybe put this subdivision number up and put this noise threshold down to something lower and that'll probably give me the quality I need and this is not full HD that's why it's rendering pretty fast if I wanted to do a final and full HD I would just have to up this and that would that would obviously make my render time go up by quite a bit probably like four times that's pretty much it and uh, yeah render settings pretty simple that's how I do it. If you know more about it than I do, as far as settings that have worked for you and optimized your, your time versus quality, then uh, let me know in the comments or whatever. And uh, yeah, that's how I do it. Those are my tips and tricks. Thanks for watching.